So let me uh, finish up this theme we were working on last week before we uh, go back to the text. Um, when we did the last phase of the meditation practice, we talked about how to focus, gather in the mind, how to bring attention to single-pointedness, uh, the various techniques for the mental or the inner work. Um, and the theme I was stressing last week was this teaching is, is not simply um, an exercise in stillness or a yogic practice that you do for 45 minutes or an hour a day or a week, um, but rather if you look at its roots um, and its purport, it's meant to be a profound uh, pathway uh, to awakening, to profound insight, um, to wisdom, to prajna, and in a more immediate level, a complete, mm, I will say, correction or a solidifying or centering of our lives in every dimension, um, our relationship with ourselves psychologically, our social relationships with other people, uh, our relationship to the entire natural world and the cosmos. It, it touches, it adjusts, it attunes through all those dimensions. And so I was trying to stress last night though, when we say we're cultivating the mind or we're stilling the mind, what we're really doing is discovering the full potential of the mind as it works through all of our life. So one example I gave was, in the Buddhist sense, the mind is not an organ or entity. It's not like uh, an internal organ or it's uh, not even limited to one's body, but it's a distributed property. Uh, consciousness is vastly distributed and part of the awakening experience, if we're to use the Avatamsaka Sutra's language, is this cultivation of which meditation is one part is all about the understanding and expanding of the mind and all its states. So it's the, the, the self-knowledge, the knowledge of the mind, but the expanding of that consciousness to its full reach, its full scope. And in the platform search of the Sixth Patriarch, he says, this is nothing other than full, complete uh, knowledge. It, it, the, the function of this mind, he says, is vast and great. Its ability, its capacity uh, is to know all, to understand all, and to gain complete uh, human perfection and liberation. So what we're doing in the meditation practice then is only the beginning stages of understanding and expanding the mind uh, to its full potential. Now at the beginning, and again, we look at some of the teachings from the masters, they'll say, well, you don't really need to do meditation unless your mind has been constricted, bound up, um, not liberated, then you have to have the antidote. And the antidote for that is one of the practices is meditation. Our natural state of mind by these teachings is to say it is vast and great and expansive uh, and fully aware, but over time through habits, uh, through confused thinking, through grasping and attaching, all of these things, we shrink it, we shrink it. We shrink the consciousness down. We actually uh, reduce it to a very narrow uh, dimension. Uh, one of the texts I like that gives a metaphor for this is the frog in the well. The frog at the bottom of the well looking up at this little hole and thinking, ah, yes, I see the whole of the world. I see the whole of the universe. But it's it's a, it's a myopic view in a sense because the frog is limited by the well in the same way we're limited by our habitual thought patterns, our, our klesha, these are called the afflictions, and so forth. And so we're in a well. Um, the Buddha once said all of us are confined in a prison. Even though we haven't committed crimes, we're in the prison of our own limited consciousness and our own karma. So. The mind cultivation at the beginning has to happen because 
to give another phrase that my teacher used to like to use was, originally our minds are whole and complete. Originally the Buddha nature is full. But we turn our backs on that awakening to unite with the dust. And so the goal in the self-cultivation is to reverse this, to turn our backs on the dust and to go back to that awakening. And that's why in, in this teaching, in this wisdom teaching, the language that's preferred, that's always used, is to talk about it as a return. And it's sometimes called the great return. The great going back, the great reversal is another language that used because it's talking about turning back from that entanglement, turning back from that scatteredness, um, turning back, in a sense, from shrinking and going back to this expansive called the wind and light of our original ground. So the, the scattered, fragmented awareness, and sometimes the texts call this drunken dreaming. They, they, give, it a, you know, they give it an example of... Uh, the unawakened, which you could say is drowsing asleep, but they also use drunken dreaming to describe it. Um, and so, cultivation then, at the very beginning, at the very basic, is this going back or this return. So, if you look at it, one of the reasons why on a Friday night we gather together in this room, in this space, uh, for 45 minutes of very quiet sitting and then looking at the text, is part of a reversal, it's part of return. It's part of a, a medicine dose to sort of, in a sense, catalyze this intrinsic wisdom or inherent wisdom that we have again. It's very different than what we do most of our lives. Unless, of course, you're a monk or a nun and you've left home and this is your great return is, in fact, the whole of your being. But for most of us, this is a departure. It's a time apart from what we're normally doing. Um, so the goal in the meditation is to take this as uh, you, you've, you've established a foothold. There's a place, if you're climbing a mountain where you establish, you can get a, a piton in or something, and you've got something to base yourself on. And from that point, you can continue to climb the mountain. So the Friday night, in a sense, is just the beginning of a basic foothold uh, to begin this return. If the meditation is done properly and not seen as um, my Friday night, you know, chill out uh, or the one day in the week where I just sort of try to relax, but if it's seen as an integrated um, exploration and liberation, it will spill out and over into our ordinary lives, naturally. In other words, as you gather here and gather yourself back and start to feel, and I use that word feel, not just think, but actually feel viscerally, the center of your being again, balanced, whole, healthy, pure and still, aware, flexible. As you get that sense of center of balance, as you move into your life, you will now have contrast between that and what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're saying, what you're moving through. And it becomes a... Um, I guess in rockets they use gyroscope, right? This, everybody know what a gyroscope is? I, don't know, I wouldn't know how to make one, but I know what they do. <laughs> a gyroscope is a balancing or center device. No matter which way the rocket turns, it always stays centered. It's like your inner ear. If it's working properly, it keeps you from falling over. Uh, today I fell over because I had a sinus infection. My inner ear was clogged, and I was bouncing off the walls um, because I lost my gyroscope. Right? So the inner ear becomes your balancing device. Meditation is like that balancing device. The more you do this, the more you center, the more you still, the more you feel and see as you go out, your relationships will be adjusted accordingly. Your job and your career will be adjusted accordingly because you're rebalancing, you're recentering it naturally. Not just because you're thinking it through, but you're actually feeling it in a new way and seeing it in a new way your relationship to nature, your consumption patterns, your emotions, the anger, the uh, unquenchable sort of thirst for things, um, the anxiety and nervousness, the stress, all of these will stand in juxtaposition to the center. And if you're smart, which all of you are, 
and you get a feel for this, you're going to favor the return. You're going to favor the centering balance. Being Why? Because it feels good. So I want to stress this. Buddhism is not about denying pleasure. It's actually elevating your pleasure to something that's very refined. You're at a heightened state of pleasure. The pleasures you had before now look so not so pleasurable. And it's not because I've renounced them. Any more than if you go into a pool with chains on your back and you take the chains off and say, I've renounced my chains. No, you haven't. You freed yourself. You can now swim and move freely. So that's why it says when you have this, you can move freely among the 10,000 things without being obstructed or attached or confused. So this moving freely is the centering. You're moving from the center. And you're able to do it more widely and more immediately as you deepen the centering practice of finding who you are and how to steer. Does this sort of make sense? So that's why when we're talking about this, it's often called the return. But I wanted to put up some quotes now tonight to sort of look at this. These are quotes that our teacher shared with us and I found very helpful on our beginning stages. Uh, most of these are from the Tao Te Ching. Uh, are we up and running? Well, this is the Tao Te Ching, too. It says, you know, in the natural, there's an uncarved block. It's like a, a screen with nothing on it. <laughs> and now we're going to add the myriad things. What's that? The ones I sent you last week? And I sent them to you five minutes before the class started. I messed up your meditation, and I apologize. <laughs> right. So we're going to look at that. The first thing I want to look at, though, is this very interesting notion. The return. Let's go back here. Learning. You got that one? Consist. It's up above. Mm-hmm. Got it? Keep going. Back. That's all I sent you? Yeah. Uh, you sent out the gene two weeks ago. Yeah. You're going to have to go back a little further. This shows you how slow I am. I'm going back to quotes I wanted to use two weeks ago. Yeah. Learning consists. Yeah, well, let's look at that one while he's got it up. And then it's going to be the one in front of this. This is a really good line. Um, use the Tao here as this path I'm talking about, this way of returning, going back. That's what the path means. And the Tao is not something you think about, and it's not something you have, but it's something you do. So that's why it says, if you don't walk it, it's not a Tao, it's not a path. <laughs> The path is in the walking of it. There's no other path except the walking. So in this, the only emotion is returning, and the only useful quality is ro, which is translated as weakness or softness or vulnerability. So again, what's being described here is the idea of the return. You're going back. And the useful quality in the going back is the ability to be soft and vulnerable and to let go. Not stiffness, not hardness, not will and determination so much at all, but in this ability to let go of things. Why? Because you're turning your back on the dust. You're dropping the dust to go back. And so to drop that, you have to release your hold. Now, in terms of stress and anxiety, you can see what this means on a physical level. You indeed become softer and more pliant in body, in mind, in emotions, and so forth. Now, if we go back up to the previous... Is that the learning? Consist? Yes. Okay. So this describes... the reverse method. So it says learning consist in adding to one stock by day, day by day. This is the, the normal way we think about learning. Learning a subject. Um, if you were in school, you added to your stock day by day. 
um, as the test got near, you not only added, but you crammed. <laughs> you crammed it in until you were about to burst, and then you walked into the exam hall and spilled it all out and got a grade. Okay, this is called adding to your stock day by day. And the problem with this is you don't retain it. You empty it out, and then you stuff in for the next course. You stuff it all in again, and then you spill it all out, and you go through a whole four years like this, and it's quite expensive, and who knows what you got there. But never mind, I won't editorialize. Okay, so, but the practice of the Tao consists in subtracting day by day. So it's, it's, it's sort of counterintuitive here. It says subtracting and yet again subtracting till you've reached inactivity. You've reached the stillness, the total receptivity. And this is where the expression comes, to the still mind, the universe surrenders. To the still mind, everything then becomes apparent, and we have the metaphor of the calm water reflecting the moon. And by this very inactivity, everything can be activated. And now you can be active, you can be responsive, you can be nimble, you can be awakened. So the awakened state is activated, but there's no clinging, and so it's super fast, super responsive, and super alert. Those, it says, uh, da da da, we'll leave that. We don't have to, those, that's the passage I just want to share with you. And I found this very useful. Okay? So, if we're looking at this, then we talk about it as a return. And that's some, sometimes when you hear the expression jirguan. What does jirguan mean? Those of you who know Chinese, even though my character pronunciation isn't so good. Jir and guan, stop, and contemplating. Shamata vipassana, if you want to use the other language for it. Stopping is the actual reverse, the beginning of the reversal, if you want to look at it that way. What you're doing is you're stopping all the outflowing. You're stopping the myriad discursive uh, flowing into the, you know, to the dust and so forth. And by stopping and holding, you again begin to take the position to do the return. So initially, the stopping uh, is absolutely essential. The word that Hanshan used is very interesting. Remember, he uses staunching. And he uses it in almost in a medical sense. If you cut an artery or vein or you're bleeding, you staunch the flow. The same idea of stopping. So here the language is to describe before the return, you have to then reverse that to stop or return it. Now, the problem with this is, <laughs> at the beginning, it feels weird a little bit because we're so used to going with the flow. Uh, what, was, um, what was one of the expressions from the 60s? I've been down so long, it looks like up to me. <laughs> that expression means once you get in a habitual pattern, to stop already feels weird, and to reverse it feels even more strange, unsettling. And hence, the softness, because at that point, you have to relax and let go and be willing to be vulnerable. My teacher said you have to even be willing to be fooled, foolish, like a fool. So to become a great sage, first you have to become a big fool, was his expression. Foolish in the sense of reversing the flow. So if you go into your center, if you go in and cultivate like this, you're not going to get a lot of massive support from people. It doesn't look like you're doing anything, right? Tonight, sitting here to a lot of people would look like, what are you doing? Well, we're, we're doing nothing, <laughs> which is not what we're really doing, but... It can seem like we're, but if we were really doing nothing, we, that would be great. But we're not, we're trying to do nothing, <laughs> which is not as easy as it sounds. That being said, all the texts describe the person or persons when they begin this reversal and go back don't look like worldly, crisp, confident people. They look like little children, and they're described as little children. They look bumbling and uncertain. There's a kind of uh, look on their faces. If you ever watch kids when, when they're very young and they encounter something for the first time, they're just like, right? If you have really small children um, and you put them in some setting, they'll often just freeze and kind of look. And you're saying, oh, isn't that wonderful? You should be happy and clap. And you take their hands and you make them clap. And they're just like looking at you. 
this is so weird, I'm out of here. And it takes them a while to figure out it's not weird. But whether that's growing up or not is a question. <laughs> but we adjust and we learn to play this game to go forward and be confident and crisp in the world when we know most of it is hollow and empty, but we do it and we get rewarded for that. Now, if you want to go back to the root, return to the source, you're going to look a little dumb and bewildered only because you lost that natural innocence, you've cultivated yourself to a high state of afflicted awareness, <laughs> And now you're going to have to reverse that. And that untangling, that disentangling, for example, you won't say things you don't mean. How far are you going to get with that? <laughs> Try it. Try it at the next party you go to. Speak true. You won't do things that don't intrinsically bring something meaningful to yourself and to others. That would eliminate a lot. So, that's the next passage I want to show you because this really helped uh, us at the beginning, this language uh, that captures these feelings and in a sense uh, makes them okay. Let me see if I can find it now. Okay, here we go. Now we're going to have when the, when the person, highest capacities. Got it? Oh, you went, lost it again. Keep going. Oh, there. So this says, uh, translate, when a person, not a man, of uh, the highest potentials hears about this Tao, he or she does it best to put it into practice. When someone of a middling capacity hears about it, he or she has two minds about it, which is, um, yeah, I want to go, but then, you, so two steps forward, two steps back, or two steps forward, one step back, or two steps forward, three steps back, however you do this back and forth. Um, I've seen this in the years at the monastery. I've seen people come and go and go and come and come and go like the seasons. Uh, somebody will come in and say, man, I'm just tired of the dust. I'm burned out. I really want to reverse it. I'm going to take the precepts. I'm going to cultivate every week. I'm going to that session, and I'm going to keep this up. And all of a sudden, where'd they go? They'd be gone. And you wait a month, two months, maybe a year, two years, pretty soon, coming back. A little more bedraggled, a little more, you know, and do it again. And this is that middling capacity. Now, we do it while we're sitting here. Wow, this is really good. What am I doing here? No, this is right. I should be doing uh, Well, I could be doing That's the middling, back and forth. You have this internal debate with yourself. That's the middling. Uh, when, when people of the low capacity, they just laugh at it when they hear about it. How stupid. So, here's the proverb that he's talking about. And this is why I'm talking about the reversal at the beginning can seem like a contrary movement to us. The way out into the light often looks dark. This is talking about that reversal. The way that goes ahead often looks as if it were, went back. The way that is least hilly looks as if it went up and down. And the power that is really the loftiest looks like an abyss. What is the sheerest white looks blurred. The power that is most sufficing looks and seems inadequate. He's describing the feelings one has when you begin this practice. And the power that stands firmest looks flimsy. And what in its natural pure state looks faded. The largest square has no corners. The greatest vessel takes the longest to finish because you're cooking it in the fire. You're heating it. And the greatest, uh, the greatest music has the most subtle and faint of notes, and so forth. He's giving these contrasts to describe the initial feelings that one would have in doing this. And in a sense, if you read this, you can feel a little better that you're not off. In fact, it's right on, but it feels off. And he would, by contrast, to say, and that which looks right on is really off. So... I would give you an example of watch someone speaking from their heart, giving a Dharma talk, how they sort of pause and stutter, and sometimes they don't even look up. And if you listen carefully, you'll just hear this wonderful, penetrating teaching. And then watch, let's say, C-SPAN tonight with the politicians. Okay? And watch how they speak with such confidence, with such aplomb, with such rhetoric. And it mostly BS. 
and they don't believe it. So if you are moving in this direction, you become more childlike, you become more true and innocent, and you don't play the games as much. Because to get close to the Tao, you have to return to this natural state. So in the sense, why people leave home <laughs> or come to the monastery more often is because that's where it's comfortable. <laughs> it's actually a place that you can be your own self, your own being again, without having to put on all the games and facades and everything like this. That's why people draw near. It's not like they're trying to escape reality. They're trying to go into the core of their reality. They're trying to return to what is real. And therefore, it feels more comfortable to hang out here. <laughs> it's not that they couldn't make it on the outside. It's the opposite. All of the Buddha's early disciples, most of them, uh, were MBA CEO types. <laughs> They're all highly accomplished and successful, which is why they saw through it faster, because they had tasted it directly. So their suffering wasn't the suffering of not having. Their suffering was the suffering of having and realizing it wasn't worth having. <laughs> That's why they moved back to this. But if you have nothing to move back to, it's depression, it's anxiety, it's emptiness. If you have no, no path to return on, then you see it, you sense it, you feel it. But there's a sickness, there's an ox, because there's nothing to go back, to reverse towards. That's why these teachings are so vital, because they're actually giving a pathway back, a return. Okay? So, let me see if I got one more I wanted to share. Yeah, I did, but it's not here. It's one about, so, to become whole again, you have to get out of shape a little bit. To become straight, you have to be twisted. Uh, to gain strength, you have to be weakened. This is the nature of this practice. So, I wanted to share that with you tonight because some of you may have these feelings when you actually begin the practice. But realize that this is a very ancient practice. This goes way back. It's, it's tried and true. And the descriptions you're getting tonight should be able to help you get a perspective on states you might experience, which is what Han Shan is talking about here, as you go into this. It's not always the feeling of awakened, bright, rosy, uplifting euphoria. Until you, get, you jettison what's holding you up, until you get the sickness out, um, one expression I might have to be rather coarse when we were children. I'll give you two examples from my childhood. Um, one is if we ate too much candy, and usually it was around Halloween, uh, because there there was no controls. Uh, now, I know today in my neighborhood, kids go out to seven or eight houses with their parents in hand with these tiny little bags and these trick-or-treat, and they get all these wholesome, politically correct things to eat. Okay, and they go back home. Yeah. And this, well, when we were kids, we would take, like, the uh, Trader Joe's shopping bags. We would canvas a town. We would change our costumes, get another bag, and go out and canvas twice. And if we had enough time, we'd do it three times. So we came home with three bags full of junk food. <laughs> and, you know, our parents would go, oh, well, you know, here they go. And then would begin the deluge. <laughs> Just stuff and stuff and stuff. And then um, we'd stuff till we got sick, literally sick to our stomachs. So what was absolutely delightful and desirous now became so sick. And then my mother would step in and she'd say, how do you feel? And we'd go, oh. And she says, now you have to go to the bathroom and you have to get that out of your system or otherwise you're just going to stay sick like this. It'll just fester. What do you mean? You have to go and put your finger to the back. And it was like, I hated to do that. Because that really felt worse than what I was feeling. You know what I mean? And yet, so she would basically, you know, put cotton in the corner and put her own finger down because I wouldn't do it. I'd go, it's not working. And she would put it in, and then, blah, okay. So, <laughs> sorry if you've all eaten. It would all come out. And then, strangely, I felt better. I felt better, because it was out, and my, my natural was returning. So there's one example I give you. If you've in inundated yourself with unwholesome karma, 
you're, we are sick in a sense. We got it sitting there and it needs to come out. So in the process of meditating, of bowing, holding precepts, you're beginning to detoxify. It's not digital detox, which is another level we're all going to go through. Detoxing from the digital devices, that's the newest thing. But, and, and that's, I didn't have that as a child. But we're talking about all the bad habits, all the faults, all the accumulated karma that's inside, that's working through our system, has to be cleansed, cleaned out. This is why repentance and reform is part of that. The other example I'll give you from my childhood, um, I grew up in the Midwest and it got really cold in the winter. It would sometimes go for three, four weeks at a time at minus 20, minus 30. And of course, we would not be deterred from going out and playing because the snow was just monstrously high and we could go out and make tunnels and forts. Uh, some of the kids I didn't do, but some of the kids I knew actually built uh, little forts and piled them with snowballs, so when the school bus went by, they would pummel the school bus with snowballs. I heard about this, but I never did things like that. And then you'd duck under your fort, and nobody would see you, because <laughs> it was so deep. Or we'd get on the roof of the house and do it. That was even better. Um, but it was so much fun, because you had ice skating, you had snowballs, you had snowman, uh, and so forth. And after a certain time, I could hear my mother calling, telling me to come in. I'd say, bug off. I'm really having a good time. She says, no, you must come in now. You've been out too long. Uh, and she would say, you're nearly frozen. I'd say, no, I feel fine. What are you talking about? And, of course, if you looked at my skin, you would know <laughs> that I wasn't fine. I was turning blue and white and getting splotched and speckled. But I had acclimatized myself, acclimated myself to the snow and the cold, so I felt okay not feeling. Now, why, when I fell down and cut myself, I didn't feel any pain? That's pretty cool. You know, I cut myself on an icicle or something, and it didn't hurt. So I just keep going like this, and she insists I come in, so she'd actually go out and pull me in, and then take my clothes off and sit me down in front of the, the wood stove, and I go, I don't need to do this. And all of a sudden, whoa, the tingling, painful sensation all over my face and hands as my circulation came back through the warmth was utterly painful to me. And sometimes I would cry, and she said, wait, 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 wait. And then suddenly, as it def I defrosted, <laughs> and the color came back, and I had a little soup, I thought, wow, this is pretty good. <laughs> and I felt whole and complete again. But the passage I had to go through from getting to be frozen to thawed out was not pleasant. It was very painful. So too with awakening. Okay? So from the Buddha's sense, when, when the Buddha says afflictions are bodhi, and then he uses a metaphor, ice is water, of a single substance. In the form of ice, it's frozen stiff and hard. When it's melted, it becomes water. That's bodhi. One substance in two different forms. In the same way for us, as we begin these practices, we're going to start to thaw out. And it's going to tingle, and it's going to feel uncomfortable. And there's feelings that you have that you won't even remember, necessarily, if it's been really long since you've been in touch with yourself. And so you just painfully and patiently go through this because at the end it clears and your whole and complete in circulation is back. So to finish this topic that I wanted to stress, I want to say that meditation that we're doing here is not just sitting cross-legged or even investigating a meditation topic or something you have a chart, you know, of a progress chart. You know, like when you practice music, you get a star and you fill it in and pretty soon you get to first level. You have a little recital and, you know, everybody applauds and you go to the next level, next level. Meditation doesn't work that way. So don't look for stars or giving yourself stars. Don't look for anything to happen. Don't expect anything out of this except a little thawing now and again, which won't feel like enlightenment. It'll feel like stinging nettles. I'm using metaphor here, okay? So it's not about getting anything or obtaining anything. It's simply about allowing yourself to return to your natural, original mind. That's all that's happening. Some people will be fast. Some people will take a little longer. Some will come and go. But once you're on the path, if you just stay there, eventually you go back. So the meditation is really about just reining in the monkey mind. And it's a kind of carefulness about what we eat with our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and consciousness. I'm using this again as a metaphor. What we take in, we become. 
there's an anthropological expression, we become what we behold. So with our eyes, we become what we behold. We become what we hear. We become what we taste. We become what we hunger for. We become what we're afraid of. And so the eating is careful what you take in, and at the same time, allowing the monkey mind to, to settle. My teacher used to say it's sifting through the sand to get the gold, or getting rid of the dross, the negative emotions, negative feelings, negative thoughts, these patterns and habits, even re-examining and reconsidering our relationships, our job, our ambitions, our goals. All of this comes in for review on the meditation process. This is the spilling over of the meditation to the whole of life. Until progressively, and this is the metaphor that's given, we become progressively more pure and still, and the Avatamska says, like gold, repeatedly put into the fire and smelt it again and again and again until at the end it's 100% pure. And then the clear, still, and troubled mind returns. Now, from my point of view, this is nianfu. <laughs> this process, this reviewing, this examination, this jettisoning, keeping the true, getting rid of the false, this process is actually mindfulness of the Buddha. Nianfu. It's the Buddha of our own nature. That's what we are being mindful of. And this is what I would call dhyana or chan. And in this way, then, the Pure Land and the Chan School synthesize, because they are not two. So you say, I'm mindful of the Buddha, I'm mindful of the Buddha. But it's more important to be mindful of the Buddha of your own nature and discover that Buddha. That's the most important ground to cultivate. Mindfulness of the Buddha out there is, again, an expedient to return the light to find the Buddha of one's own nature. So Chan, properly done, is not closing off the mind to be still and blank. It's actually the purging, the cleansing, the purifying of the mind so it returns to its natural state. That's mindfulness of the Buddha, the Buddha within. Okay, enough on that. Questions? Anything on the meditation practice? Yes. Ah, so this is actually, anybody want to explain it in Chinese? There's different ways to translate it. I like the literal. The wind and light of my original home or ground is the expression that's used. It, huh? It's sometimes used as an equivalent for the, your original mind, your natural mind, your true mind, uh, your original face. But this way it's used in a... Um, in the sense of the return. So the image you have is someone who's left home, like a prodigal child, off wandering the world, place to place, country to country, a lost and adrift, and then finally finds his or her way home. And as that person's coming back into their home, um, for my uh, grandmother, it was her, her trip after many, many years back to Ireland where she had come as a child, very young, settled in here, made the adjustments and adaptations, but my grandfather described her face when she got near enough to the shores and smelt the wind blowing off the shores with the smell of Ireland and the light of Ireland. She connected. She was back into something primal and deep that she had her identity with. So the wind and light of one's original ground is a metaphor for coming home <clears throat> to the safe, comfortable root that is you, but it also is an inner return, the wind and light of the original is coming back to your own true mind, your own original mind. So that's what it means. But it's a poetic metaphor that I think is, is really apt and really captures it. And it's said when you're there, you almost, and sometimes what happens is people cry. And the reason they cry is, is with true homecoming, the feelings are so complex and so full to be back that it's inexpressible in words and just the emotions well up that I'm at last home. Uh, I myself had this experience coming to the monastery for the first time. When I walked in, uh, the tears welled up because I felt, wow, I'm home. Now you have to imagine, I'm from Wisconsin and I'm walking into a Chinese monastery with all these gilded images and incense and shaved headed people running around and I felt like, I'm home. <laughs> So, obviously, the wind and light of one original ground may go back quite a ways. It may not be 
you know, Chicago or New York or Taiwan or something. It's talking about a deep, um, existential, deep mind ground that you're returning to. And once you know that place, once you have that flavor, it said that becomes in your point of balance. You want to stay close to that. You want to stay. So if it's that, you, you keep going. If it's not, you pull back from that. But you don't lose that original ground. This is called the essential nature. So at all times, walking, standing, sitting, lying down, even in sleep, do not separate from this. That's the expression. If you do, you'll go amiss. So once you have that ground, once you get the feeling, and so the practice here tonight is in a sense trying to get back, trying to get the flavor, the wind and light of that original ground a bit. Okay? So I wanted to share this with you because the text sometimes can be right on the mark, but when I was beginning, it was, it was text like this and language like this, and then my teacher would actually come out to us when we were along the highway bowing or during a meditation session, and he'd actually drop one of these lines in. He'd be talking and say, well, what's up? And you'd say, oh, man, my meditation's really hard. I got all these afflictions. I'm angry and jealous and blah, blah, blah. And he said, and he would say something like, well, to become a whole, you have to become twisted. Sometimes the, the way up looks really dark. And you would get... And you say, oh, I get it. He's connecting my state to the passage. Wow, these passages are actually pretty interesting because they're talking about real things. And making that connection between the, the principle and the specific made the text come alive. And his point was that having him as a teacher, he was only facilitating us finding the teacher in the teachings. So by making these connections to us, all of these passages and have personal meaning for me because of the way they were used in cultivation. But one of the reasons why you memorize these passages is that when you're on your own cultivating, at moments like this, unexpectedly, one of these lines can come up and actually be sort of a lifeline, a, a beacon uh, to bring you back and to keep you centered. So pretty good stuff. Well, <laughs> that took us to the preliminaries, and now it's 9 o'clock and we're ready for the text, so I guess we'll have to worry about the text next week. Uh, but next week, um, I'm going to bring up some JPEGs. Is that right? JPEGs. So instead of illustrating with poetry, I'm going to use pictures. And he's going to talk about the lair, the, the, the bandit's den of your consciousness that you get stuck in. And I'm going to have a picture to illustrate that. And then he's going to talk about breaking through uh, the, the layer of the eighth consciousness, and I got pictures to illustrate that, um, I think. Uh, so next week, we'll come back to the text, and we'll come back to some more graphic uh, images. But if you actually use these passages in this text that we use tonight, the graphic images are, are in them, and they will come up. Moreover, and this is just a sidelight, there's something in these texts, the sutras and these types of passages, where the metaphors, the language, and even the tone, and even what's between the lines, if I could say the spirit of them, to me has an eternal quality about them. It's, it's a language, it's a... Um, uh, I guess language is the closer I get. It's almost a sound that is so true, so solid, that goes way back and continues to resonate and goes into us in a different way than ordinary language or literature does. And I think that this, these, these, this language and the, and the energy and the light they put out have an effect on us that's even beyond the words and the content. There's something in the text themselves and the way they've been set up and the way they've been arranged in this way is medicine at many, many di different levels. Um, the experience I, I just had in Los Angeles was uh, we were there, I had a session, we were talking, and there was a passage about, in, in our talk, we were just talking about how, how it is difficult to start, especially in Los Angeles. We talk about Frozen. You know, <laughs> if you're like Hong Kong or Los Angeles, you're really successful. Wow, you got some miles to cover on the return. Um, and so we're going into this, and this, there was a doctor there, and she said, you know, I was really feeling kind of, uh, despondent or geez should I even bother trying this uh, and then she said and I read the we read this passage of text from the platform sutra which was saying the same thing 
And she said, and suddenly I felt happy and uplifted. And even though the text was saying that it's hard and difficult, somehow it conveyed to her hope, a, a confidence, an uplift, that ordinary language went. So what it is about these texts, I don't know. Uh, when I've taught them before, like the Avatamsaka text, I was teaching at GTU and one of the students came up who wasn't Buddhist at all and said, okay, I, you mentioned the best way to get into Buddhism to go directly to the primary sources. Don't go to the, you know, the bookstore and buy all the secondary sources, uh, people talking about Buddhism. Go and actually read the words. So he said, what, what, what should I read? So I thought, okay, this is a really smart kid. I'm, and I'm going to say the Dhammapada or the Sutra. For, yeah, try the Avatamsaka, which is like the king of kings, right? It's huge. And I thought, that'll keep him from bothering me a while. <laughs> <laughs> and three weeks later, he came back. He said, wow. I said, what? He said, that text. And he actually read it? Yeah, he says, I was, I'm reading it every night. I said, what do you think? He says, I don't. I said, what do you mean you don't? He says, I can't understand it. It's completely incomprehensible. I said, so why are you saying wow? He says, my dreams at night are filled with these crystal images and, and I smell fragrance in my sleep. And he says, wow, this is really trippy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Avatamska is full of these and streaming banners came down and wonderful flowers arose and put out a fragrance that moved 10,000 miles and all beings that smelled it immediately resolved their hearts and body and had no more afflictions and so forth. And it goes on and on like this. And you're kind of like, wow, that's really not, not my garden. You know, and you're going. But what it does is the language and the metaphors somehow go to a deep level and actually cleanse the mind and open up pathways for awakening that is within language but beyond language. It's a very interesting thing. So I started to appreciate through students like that, even someone who wasn't a believer in Buddhism, that the actual mm, spirit and imagery is coming from some ground that's meant to work past the cognitive mind and open up something at a deeper level. I'm convinced, too, over the years that chanting, even the incense, and the rituals and devotions have a similar effect. They hit aspects of knowing and awareness that are not just intellectual and are probably even more powerful than our thoughts. And so the whole panoply of practices, if seen in the right way, are merely catalysts for getting at the deeper layers of awareness and consciousness that we have, lying dormant or frozen. Uh, so this will keep all of you from moving to the Midwest, too. <laughs> okay, so we'll stop there. Next week we'll go back to Han Shan and continue with the, with the text. Uh, any announcements? Anything happening people should know about? You told me there was some Dharma assembly here tomorrow? There's, there's a 9 o'clock Dharma assembly as usual. We're saying the Kulmin King, the Universal Door chapter, that's associated with the, the Bodhisattva of Great Compassion, Gwen Shireen. Mm -hmm. That's at 9. And then this is normal schedule here. We have Meditation in the morning and the afternoons at 6.15 in the morning, 5.15 in the afternoon. We have the evening ceremony, and we still have, we have our regular Avatamsaka Sutra lecture, which uh, Marty just mentioned. And they're doing the uh, Ten Grounds right now, and the Ten Grounds are really the Ten uh, Basic uh, Grounds of One's Own Mind or Consciousness. It's described in Ten Stages. So again, it's not about Ten grounds out there, but it's about the innate potential we have uh, to go through degrees of awakening. That's the ten grounds, and it's one of the two sections of that text that still exist in Sanskrit. Um, yes, uh, loud. Uh, also here. Yeah. What time? Okay. Any, anything else? A.M., not a P.M. Yeah. 7.30 a.m. It's all day. 7.30 a.m. is like 5 p.m. <laughs> Very slow walking, meditation, reciting. Some people don't even know that's an hour in the day. <laughs> okay. <laughs>